Merci beaucoup. Okay, so now we're going to hear from three amazing people who have tremendous depth of experience in this space. Um, Helle Jorgensen. Helle, do you want to come out? Helle Jorgensen is the founder and CEO of Competent Boards. She trains boards and is the author of Stewards of the Future. Uh, full disclosure, I am a member of her faculty and I uh, interviewed her on my show, Electric Ladies Podcast. And Anne Desirable, if I said it correctly, I hope. Huh? Oh, Isabel, I'm sorry. Isabel Romartre. Thank you so much. Isabel is founder and CEO of Goodness and Company uh, organization, the company that works with companies, including their boards of directors on leading change. And Antoine Algols, I'm butchering everybody's name, but bear with me, I'm sorry. Founder and CEO of Tulip Share, which helps investors drive a purpose planet, people focused economy. That's what we're all here for, right? And also to earn healthy returns on their investments, because if they don't have those, then they won't. Um, he's really focused on leveraging board, leveraging the investors to create activist investors. Um, can I get a real uh, accurate time clock on the time clock, please? It's still on Isabel. Thank you, appreciate it. Okay. First thing I want to do is set the field a little bit more and have Hele talk about the role of a board of directors, if you would, because not everybody here understand. Nobody, not everybody here is on a board. Never, you know, not some people here don't really understand how that works. Naturally, every company has a, their own board. Uh, the companies that have boards they function a little bit differently. But give us a kind of a board 101 to just make sure everybody is. <laughs> coming together on this ride. A board 101. Okay, how many here serves at a board? Hands up. How many of hey, you have ever served How many served on want a board? to? Okay. You're risky people. Um, so the board hires and fires the CEO. That's just one of the jobs. Apart from that, they are to provide oversight. So they are the ones who need, in my opinion, to have all the insight and the foresight in order to provide that oversight. If you're not informed, it's a kind of hard to make informed decisions. So that's what we are trying to do. We are educating board of directors, future board of directors all over the world, so in over 50 countries. And it is to, as Isabel was saying before, actually to have that knowledge so you can make the right decisions for the company and also have that purpose. Not only what is the purpose of the company, but what's the purpose of the board? So actually have that discussion. Are we here just to do the compliance, as Isabel was saying, tick mark, tick mark, tick mark? Or are we actually here to move that company forward? And I would clearly say it's, it's the latter. We need to move forward. And we need to have board of directors that have the insight to oversee that transition that all of the companies are now part of. I think the operative word in that too is oversee, right? Because the board, to clarify, doesn't actually have an operational role in the organization, right? Oh, no, 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 no. Right. Management, execute, the board oversee. That's the whole governance. That's the whole idea here. We need to have the governance in place. Someone needs to make sure that someone else is doing the job. Right, and they have a uh, fiduciary responsibility to the investors, to the shareholders. And in today's world, now we have stakeholder capitalism, right? So there's multiple stakeholders. Isabel, um, you've been working with companies and boards to help them transition to a clean energy economy, a carbon neutral economy. Um, how, tell us a, a few things that you have found, particularly for boards that got boards on board, to use the title of our session, to make the transition. I mean, like Isabel was saying, they were on board for a while and then they kind of got cold feet, right? So how do you, but they did transition. 
So how, what have you learned from this? I mean, what are some of the takeaways in your experience of actually being in the room with these people, driving this change? Thank you, Jörn. So I believe actually we are at the tipping points. When business needs to reinvent themselves to demonstrate their contribution to society, time is now for business to be purposeful. And this is not so easy. So what we have done is that we have built a collective movement called Generation Glasgow with two allies, Qantas and Boson. And we have built this movement with 36 exactly, executive from around the world, CEOs, thought leaders, academics. And we tried together because they were so eager to really make the shift happen, you know, moving from purpose to practice, from words to action. We wanted to understand from their perspective what were the main obstacles for it not to happen at the speed and the scale that we needed. Well, guess what? What is the first obstacle on the way? The board. So, don't, don't point to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're here together, Hella. We need you. So, um, therefore, uh, when we look at the board, so the board is now becoming under scrutiny. We are all conscious now that the board is a pivotal place for it to happen. And it's not so easy. So, we did actually interview leaders around the world, and this is what we came out with three elements to really understand what was holding the board back. Of course, training is critical, but that's not the only thing. So we looked at it and what is holding their back? How can we move the needle? Three things. The first thing is really how do we shift when we talk about positive impact and you are many in the room to be fully aware of what it takes, right? The reality is that we are moving from a shareholder economy to a stakeholder economy. So what does it mean in terms of the boardroom? How can we welcome the diversity of the members to, for them, not just to represent the shareholders, but to welcome the diversity of perspective of the whole company, of suppliers, of consumers, of employees? How do we do that? 57% are saying diversity is a bottleneck. You know? And the reality, what is it? Is that how do you select board member? Because we select them most of the time because they are experienced people, right? Experience meaning that they have a huge experience in the way you manage business, I must say, in the past. So how do you transform that? So that's the number one. How do you welcome that? And for instance, mother nature. Can we have mother nature as a board member? If not, can that. we speak on its behalf? So that's the first dimension, is diversity. The second one, as Isabel was saying, and that is so key to my heart, is how do we move from a hygiene perspective to a competitive edge perspective? Sustainability is not anymore about hygiene. It's about how do you reinvent your business model? And that's not so easy, but the shift needs to happen in the boardroom. What if they were asking the relevant questions, you know, a little more than what is our purpose, I believe. It is more about how do we make our product portfolio evolve? What are the brands that are really embracing positive impact with stakeholders around them? How do we shift, you know, moving from competitive era to a more cooperative era? How does this happen? This is not easy question. We need the board to really help the executive team. And last but not least, a lot of times it is about one individual at the board who really, you know, align. It's heads and hearts about making it happen. But it needs to be standardized. It cannot be one individual responsibility. It needs to be the collective and therefore we need standardization of the responsibility of the board. And here, two elements. Of course, we have the CSRD that is moving the needle and we are so happy about it. This will help to, you know, to avoid less and less greenwashing and to move towards more transparency. But the reality is that it's not enough. We need also, and this is my question to you, is how can we align? It's all about alignment in life. Right. How can we align the reward or incentive of the board member 
with their impact or with how they behave and how, what are the decisions they take in sustainable business. And that's not there yet. Yes, as uh, Isabel said, you can't teach caring, but you need a board that's going to care as much as they're going to be, be focused on the bottom line and be able to see it as a competitive advantage. Um, Antoine, there's been a uh, dramatic rise in activist investors, uh, especially in this space. There are tools that, the, that investors li they, like you and that you represent have at their disposal to drive this change. Um, I don't know if you all have paid any attention to this, but Exxon Mobil um, fairly recently had to change board members uh, as a result of activist investors and bring on, get rid of some fossil fuel committed investors and bring on some climate friendly, anyway, investors. And then also, f most recently, I think this week, f uh, Shell had a, had a rebellion, if you will, at their annual meeting um, by climate activists. So talk about some of the tools that investors who, well, they're the shareholders, right, that the board ultimately speaks for. How do, what kind of tools do you guys have at your disposal? And anybody here who, I mean, I'm, everybody here have investments? Okay, you're an investor. If you have a 401k, if you have anything in the market, you are an investor. And so listen up for tools that he might give us to try to drive the board in this direction and force the company to change to a more carbon neutral business model. Thank you. So I completely agree that we are at a tipping point. But the tipping point I see it is more who gets to say in the way the business is run. Is it the shareholder? Is it the board member? Or is it the exec team? And you notice this power dynamic is a bit shifting. The exec team thinks that they can run the daily operations. The board members are here to apply governance, but they are nominated by the shareholders. So ultimately, it's wherever your money is invested, you should have a say in the way the business is run. And um, as an impact-driven asset manager, we take equity position in publicly listed company, and then utilize all of the tools of corporate governance, such as nominating a board member, challenging a board member, and especially, how do you track the performance of a good board member? If you are a, a private company owner, if it's your business, then you can nominate anyone you want. Uh, you can choose to have a diverse board, or you can choose to have a board that is going always in your direction as a majority interest. But if you're in a public listed company, well, usually your stocks are split among a lot of investors and therefore they have a say in the way who's nominated or not. I don't know who here um, has uh, stocks, but how many of you have ever voted on a director nomination or challenge? The, yeah, very little, mm -hmm. you see? That, and that's the problem. That's the actual problem. Then who's voting? Who's voting to control the, the shell directors? The, who's voting to, to make sure that NG uh, board members are actually uh, in line with the company's mission. Um, so this is where the, the big challenges are ahead. First tip is really to make sure to understand, you know, what, where is my money, where are my investments, and how is it being voted on? Who's actually voting for me if I'm not voting? Who's, who's utilizing this AUM uh, voting power that is super important and critical in the governance of a company, in the future of its mission. And it's a very sad reality, and that's why I think we're all here, that there is, was only two people that lift their hands and say, I'm actually voting at every AGM on director's nomination and, and challenges. Um, you can also submit shareholder proposal that are receiving a board recommendation. Most of the time, my advice, if you submit shareholder proposal to a company, the boards will say, this is not your prerogative. This, you're a shareholder, you should be here for value, not to try to drive the, the, the management and change in the company. Well, I think we're at the tipping point of a huge difference. If you are a shareholder in a company, you should have a say in the way the business is run, and that's the only way forward where we're gonna come to systemic, sustainable, and more fair change in, uh, in the world. Merci beaucoup. I just wanna say, um, you may be seeing sketches, I forgot to say, because it's a new thing. We have a fabulous woman who is an illustrator who is doing sketches, and we are going to have the big reveal of their sketch of this session at the end. 
Um, Helen, you, yeah, yes. le lever leverage, no, I want to go to you now. Leverage can, off can of I? what, yes, leverage off of what Antoine said, and then also talk about um, the, the ways that in, in your training programs, what, what you think will work to help get boards of directors to want to embrace this kind of systemic change that we need to drive a carbon neutral economy. It's a huge shift in the economy. It is, and can I just start by saying, so yesterday I spoke at Financial Times Moral Money in London, and I asked the question, should nature have a seat at the table? And if we think about it, nature is giving, it's actually a huge shareholder in all companies. We're all taking you know, everything for granted. But if you think about it from a shareholder perspective, investor perspective, you actually have a lot of externalities, as we're saying. Um, but a lot of money from Mother Nature is actually being taken into the company. So I said, should nature have a seat at the table? Should we, in every single time we make a decision around that boardroom table, say, what would nature say to this decision? We could also use the seven generation principles from, from indigenous uh, peoples that says seven generations from now, what will be the impact, outcome of, of the actions we have? And I think that's some of the things. The other thing I would like to have a, a, a chair here also for young people, I know we will probably after this, but, but I think that's important too, uh, to have that. And then I know you asked me about competent boards and, and what... Mm, Driving systemic change, leveraging the board to yeah. actually drive change, like Isabel was trying to do and they were trying to have her, and they were having her do at NG. Yeah, so, so I think, and I heard here at the opening, uh, was saying we all have different strategies. What are our strategies to make change? And I think my strategy, and I'm a business lawyer, I'm an accountant, don't throw tomatoes at me. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, so my strategy is that I can go in and I understand the language that the board of directors speak. I also understand the language that sustainability people speak. I've been in this field for over 30 years. And often this is about language. This is about do we actually understand what others say. But the other thing is about that insight. If we don't know, if we don't understand. So I have in, in our faculty over 180 board of directors, executives, investors, experts, that I have come and they talk to and have a dialogue with the board of directors but also uh, business leaders. And it's global, so I have people from all over the world that are joining. So one is they hear from other people oh, you're thinking like that. Oh, you're doing this and this and this way. So it's like kind of like from, from peer learning. The other thing is, and I'm gonna give you an example, um, and poor Andrew Wallace that I keep bringing him up. Andrew Wallace work in terms of Unseen. He's the CEO of Unseen. And he is looking at all of the board members and then he's asking me, him, he's asking the question, how many slaves? work for you? I'm asking you, how many slaves work for you? Mm -hmm. No slaves work for you, okay? Anyone else? You don't have any? You don't know? Yeah, that's probably a better answer. So, Andrew would say, oh. It and you're talking like about through the supply chain even. Yeah, right? well, it's, I'm, I'm talking about also people that might be cleaning up here after. That there's, uh, you know, so you look at people and he says, oh, it looks like you're wearing clothes. Um, I, I, I also looks like you actually eat from time to time. And by the way, you have one of these, right? You have at least 30 to 40 slaves working for you. So, Ellie, I want to bring it back to the, so are you saying that the board has a responsibility to understand who all is helping the company make money throughout its supply chain? Yeah, and, but, I, but I think it goes 
it goes further than that. It gets to have that, I'm just seeing wisdom, right? It gets to have that you actually understand that. So I had, I'll tell you a short story. Um, we, we have these board of directors, as I said, also business leaders going through. It's 12 different sessions. They go through everything from geopolitical, sustainable development goals, human rights, etc. And there was this chief sustainability officer. He has sent some of his board in to do the program, and they go through. And then he called me. And he said, what have you done to my board? <laughs> and Okay, I've started sweating a little bit, I have to. And then he said, it's amazing. Now they're asking me all the right questions. They are actually interested in what I'm saying. They're even asking me, do I have enough resources to make this happen? And that's what I think is the magic. It's, it's the mindset the is, is that you get to reflect. It is that you get to understand that this is, you know, something about making that change, not putting a tick mark. Right. But so Isa, is, yeah, let me just, if you want to jump in, I want to get to, I want to ask Isabel, I want to jump off of that because that really gets to who were you choosing, you know, a lot of what's underneath all of what we're saying here this morning is it's a matter of who are the bodies in those chairs, right? And um, Hele is, is helping to train them, and, but they, people have to come from somewhere in order to be in that kind of a program. So let's say we have a, somebody here has a startup and they're putting a board together or they're on a board or they want to try to pursue being on a board or, or getting uh, people for a board. What would be, is there a personality? Are there skill sets? I mean, let's, let's get rid of the old model. We need, for a new economy, we need a new type of person on a board. So what would, like, who's the ideal board member for an organization? What would be the questions that someone might ask? So because we were discussing about the diversity of the board members, there is no ideal profile. But there is one thing that I think that is critical, um, because I think it's all about alignment. And it's somebody would say, that it's easy to be aligned, you know, heads and hearts one day or one hour. It's more difficult to be aligned every single day, everywhere and every day. So therefore, my, my point is that um, it's not an easy one, but it does require one particular value that is critical. It's all about courage from my perspective. What is courage? What is courageous leadership? I believe there will be no transformation without courageous leaders. And courage is the fortitude, the strength of heart that manifests in difficult moments, in challenging situation that requires a decision, a choice. So I believe that today, as we are part of the change now, you know, change makers, we are eager to make this shift happen. It's all about us. Because if not us, who? If not now, when? And if not here, then where? And I want myself to be able to look in 10 years from now, because I believe we have 10 years, and time is now. I want in 10 years from now to be able to look at my kids' eyes and say that I've done everything I could at the time that it really matters. So that might mean you might want to sign up for Hele's program and become a board member, right? So you can bring your values to a board, right? And that's one way to transform it. So Antoine, um, I know you're dying to say something, and I want you to work it into this. Uh, in our, we have three minutes left. One of the big problems with boards is they tend to have a short-term earnings report focus. And what we're doing here to drive change to a carbon neutral economy or carbon zero economy is exactly the opposite. We need a long term focus. Um, and so how do you how do you reconcile and how do you use your power as an investor to try to drive that shift from short term focus to long term focus and also get the returns that you're looking for? Right. Because we don't want to have to give those up if we can. So my team uh, is meeting every year, uh, I think uh, between 10 to 20 uh, publicly listed board members. And um, there's not 
a single evil person that we've met. I've never met someone who works for a large beverage company to tell me, oh, I want more uh, plastic in the ocean or um, <laughs> a healthcare company saying, oh, we want more cancer causing product in our, uh, in our baby uh, product. Or nope. we, want more, we want to put more emissions in the air. Exactly, no one wants that. It's people, the board uh, sounds like a, it's a concept, but it's actual people. Uh, exec team are actual people. CEOs and uh, C-level are actual people. Shareholders are people. Um, it's, what's very interesting is we, we had a resolution at Mondelez this month on child labor. We got 19% voting support on this resolution to do a full audit. Uh, hmm. But that means that 80% of the shareholders, which are nominating board member, are n maybe not interested into that. So my, one of my very, very strong advice if I was a board member today was to look at the voting patterns. How are pensions voting? How are uh, uh, um, traditional bank, insurance company voting? How is the, the everyday retail investors voting to understand the patterns? Because there is something skewed in the voting system today at the AGM level. We, we can all feel it. Um, the reality is, uh, if I was a, a competent board member today, I would actually deep dive into the number to understand what's coming, how, how is the actual split being made, and that's, um, that's a, a, a very strong check mark to, to see if, uh, if it's performant. That's perfect. And I also want to point out, um, if you have a 401k, a lot of companies now are offering the option to invest in ESG, to have an, an ESG vertical in your 401k. So if you have one, you might talk to your company don't, about that. Don't, I, don't, I don't think that people here have a 401k. Oh, is, but, that, but, an, is that an American I, I, thing? I think, yes, it's an American I'm thing. I'm sorry. Uh, so they can have private pension in France. In you can have private pension in France. Or so. What did you say? You could have a private pension in France and look at how it's invested. So Do they have an ESG works. vertical? You, well, they all have it, but oh, you good. look into what's in it. Thank you for saving me, Hele. <laughs> I didn't realize that, obviously. Okay, I'm sorry, but that's it. That's all we have time for for now with Hele Jorgensen of Competent Boards, Antoine Agus, who's uh, of Tulip Share, and Isabel Gromat of Goodness and Company. We will all be around. I'm gonna have one more panel, but we'll all be around if you wanna pick our brains a little bit more as well. Please join me in thanking them.